we live in a very exciting time. For the first time in over 50 years, there has been a special meeting of Congress to examine the UAP UFO threat. The first time in 50 years that they've actually talked about this in a public forum. The meeting was fascinating. Interesting conversation had, and a new door opened. But why? Are we about to expose the fact that we've always been visited by aliens from another planet or another world? Or are we truly preparing ourselves for something terrestrial? Well, I know, like many of you, I'm certainly hoping it's alien in nature that we're going to be dealing with. And with the stories and the visuals that they have presented, it certainly goes a long way to make us believe that something from out of this world is making his presence known. Tonight, I'll be joined by my good friend, forensic geologist Scott Walter. Ancient alien artifacts or fiction? That's our topic tonight on the best in paranormal programming. You're listening and watching The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. I'm not going to stand here and listen to this baloney. He won't know. He doesn't stand for baloney. Sounds like a lot of supernatural baloney to me. Supernatural, perhaps. Baloney, perhaps not. I cannot even begin to tell you how excited I am about doing this program tonight. I have been friends with Scott Walter for probably a decade now. was lucky enough to have him join me live in the studio booth at the Minnesota Great Get Together, the Minnesota State Fair. And we have been talking ever since. And it's an interesting dynamic to watch somebody grow in a field that it was outside of their parameters. Uh, I remember when we first met and we started talking about the inscriptions on tombs and pyramids, about these strange alien-like artifacts. And with scientific precision, he described to me how it was probably just as other tribes came in and people took over certain areas, they would engrave their own engravings over. And as weather would come down and weather these areas, sometimes they would combine and give us these strange and unusual pictograms. And I've remained friends with Scott, even though he was a skeptic. Can you believe it? I can. But I love the fact that he has certainly broadened his horizons in the last decade and has looked at examining the truth behind many different topics. You recognize him from America on Earth and many other great projects that he's done, including searching for Templar's gold. And um, tonight we're going to talk about something that really kind of shocked me. It took me by surprise when it came to aliens. We've been opening up to one another over the last year, year and a half about our interest in ufology, aliens, and our place in history and in time. And with that said, I want to take you back in time to something that truly chilled my bones. Being a child of the 60s and early 70s, of course, we all remember In Search Of and programs like that. I remember being in Alabama at my grandparents' place in Foley, Alabama, watching a TV program because my dad and uncle and grandmother were fascinated by aliens. And there was a special report coming up. And I remember hearing this report and the actual audio that they had collected. The Virilian message was broadcast at 5.10 p.m. on Saturday, November 26, 1977. The totality of the message lasted over six minutes long. As the famous Southern Television broadcast interruption, reports of the event carried it worldwide with numerous American newspapers and TV shows picking up the story from the UPI press agency. The broadcast interruption occurred on the Hannington transmitter of the Independent Broadcasting Authority in the United Kingdom. The message was witnessed on television sets only within a radius of the Hannington transmitter, a small area of the UK. The identity of this hijacker still remains unknown. An obscure deep male voice overrode the audio signal of the early evening news from ITN. It gave a message purportedly from Ashtar Galactic Command. Their message was to mankind to end nuclear conflict and make peace with one another. And this was a clip that I actually saw back in the day. 
Indonesian nationalist leader Bishop Abel Musarewa has accepted Mr. Smith's offer to negotiate an internal settlement based on one man, one vote. But, he says, there are conditions. These include stopping the execution of all captured prisoners of war. <laughs> We come to warn you of the destiny of your race and your world so that you may communicate to your fellow beings the course you must take to avoid the disaster which threatens your world and the beings on other worlds around you. It's a short time to learn to live together in peace and goodwill. Small groups all over the planet are learning this and exist to pass on the life of the golden new age to you all. You are free to accept or reject their teachings, but only those who learn to live in peace will pass into the higher realms of spiritual evolution. Be aware also that there are many false prophets and guides at present operating on your world. They will suck your energy from you, the energy you call money, and will put it to evil ends, giving you worthless loss in return. Your inner divine self will protect you from this. You must learn to be sensitive to the voice within that can tell you what is truth and what is confusion, chaos and unknown. The audio that you just heard was the original part of the original audio that was broadcast that night. Now, it's easy, Scott, to hear that and think, oh, somebody hijacked a, a transmitter tower. It had been done before, especially in the 70s. But what really unnerved me specifically was mm. I had this radio in the 70s when CB was all the rage. Yeah. It was an AM, FM, weather, and CB radio. So I could listen to CB truckers driving around the area I lived in. And I would turn it on and listen while I was playing with my G.I. Joes and, and messing around in my room. And I remember one day I had my G.I. Joe on the bed and we're fighting with another guy and he gets knocked off the bed and boom, he hits the ground. And suddenly through the radio, I heard that mechanical voice say, that looks like it hurt. No way. And I turned and then I'm thinking, oh, well, it's probably some trucker who saw like a dead deer by the side of the road. And I pick him up and I start doing something else. And uh, this time he flips the bad guy off and the, the voice comes through again and says something to the effect of, well, he got his justice. And it was just, it was as if something was watching, but it was that same echoey mechanical voice that at the age of 54 makes the hairs on my arms stand up when yeah. I hear that. But that was my indoctrination to the world of aliens. And then I would sit there and listen to my grandmother and grandfather tell me, how they had this house not far from Pensacola, which means there was a military base, but they had come home and there was huge lights hovering over their property. No. And they believed it. They were terrified of it. They were, they would run into the house afraid they were going to be abducted. And that stayed with me my entire life. And s still to this day and to see the fear in their, their eyes. Now they were very simple folk. They weren't, I'm not saying stupid, but they were very basic in needs and in ways but to see how it affected and impacted them blew me away. Wow. D Dave, uh, that clip you just played, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I was, you actually played it for me just about 10 minutes ago, but I was listening and I could hear this voice, but I couldn't hear quite everything that was said, but it was creepy, but it was non-threatening. It was creepy, right. but I didn't feel like, uh oh, um, something bad is going to happen. What, how come I've never heard about that? What is the, what is the story behind that? I, 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 I just told you, basically it's this, that this broadcast, the Virilian broadcast took over in November of 1977 and it was spread worldwide through the news and it shared, and, and there are transcripts and you can find the full six minute audio okay. that still exists out there, but uh, there have been fake versions of it made. So you've got to be kind of cautious, but you can right. go find the transcripts of it. And it was very much about trying to stop nuclear armament. And 
being careful with the planet, which is what we hear from a lot of people who claim to be in contact with aliens. That's right. Well, that's the first thing I just thought of when you said that was that is the message that we're getting from people that that I'm in contact with. I'm sure you're hearing the same information, mm -hmm. but at this particular point in time, it's, it's more dire. It's not a warning. It's like, Hey, you better get your act together now, or it's going to be too late. But that was what back in 77. Well, I, <laughs> I graduated in 77. So that's 40 something years ago. And, um, you know, that was back at a time when it sounds like, okay, this is the first warning shot. You guys better get your act together. Right. And now here we are all these years later. And it's like, okay, <laughs> I warned you. And, you know, this is like your last chance. And I really do feel like that's, that's where things are at right now. I mean, the world has gone completely crazy. And, you know, with the war in uh, Ukraine and, you know, in this country, all the craziness that's going on, it seems to me like we're being distracted from what we should really be paying attention to. And it's our planet. You know, mm -hmm. this is our home. This is where we live. And, you know, this whole, you know, alien phenomena, this whole subject matter that, as you articulated, you know, at the start of the broadcast was something that was not on my radar, but suddenly has been, you know, thrust on my plate as a meal that I just can't ignore. I have got to face it. And I have. And as you know, you were over uh, a couple of days ago and I showed you some of the artifacts I think we're going to talk about later tonight. Oh, no, we are definitely going to talk and show <laughs> the photographs you allowed me to take. Well, um, I, I have a few wow. more on the side here. So if we need to look at some wow. more, I have some at the ready. But but you know what happened? Your reaction to them was the same reaction I did. You, I mean, first and foremost, they're beautiful. Mm -hmm. They're The artwork is really fantastic. But there's so much more going on that it just forces you to pay attention to them and ask all these questions, which you did that night. Well, let's talk about artwork. Um, I was fascinated by this. They're you know, have been so many different periods in art and history. And the Renaissance period, of course, is something that has always captured people's attention. Right. Um, and, and I was first brought to oh, aware of these strange images that appeared in Renaissance art, but yeah. it even, it even predates that. And you yes. are a geologist, a forensic geologist. You've seen cave paintings, you've seen etchings. There are some images that have appeared in different cave systems and programs that really don't seem to make sense with the type of things that they would have been trying to convey to us. As you're watching this, if you're listening to the audio, please go check out the video of this as well. You'll see all the photographs we talk about tonight, but you can see the different variations of these strange light beings with dark almond eyes that yep. were found carved and drawn into the cave walls. There were even original copper etchings and pieces. Um, this one, fascinating, right? Uh, something straight out of the Bible, right? You remember in the book of Exodus, it would talk about as the, the children of Israel were making their way across, there was this loud, loud and large cloud and craft that hovered over them, protecting them from the rain and the sun. Sometimes it would come land on the ground. A voice would speak from it. Moses went up on the mountaintop to converse with God. And this is just another one of the strange representations. There is yeah. There's strange etchings like this in, in Egyptian lore. And to us, mm -hmm. contemporary images, it looks very UFO in detail. And yeah. how would they show what it was without any understanding, without drawing representations of it? But where it gets really fascinating for me, Scott, and we're going to buzz through these art pieces because I know these have been out for a while and we'll get to your images. But yeah. I wanted mm -hmm. to set the stage, and I'm not even sure how familiar you were with this, the uh, the appearance of craft. Now, I want to talk about why this is important. Renaissance art was often commissioned by the church. Yep. And they had handwritten, detailed notes of exactly what they wanted represented in these pictures. Right. So mm -hmm. understand, we know what cherubs and angels looked like because that was there was a style in the way that they created those. So there are things in these paintings that make no logical sense to our knowledge. How would you explain them? Uh, a lot of them seem to center on very historic moments in biblical legend and lore, like the crucifixion of Christ. And you'll right. notice in this portrait, you see Christ hanging there and you see these two 
images. Now, some will say it's a representation of the sun and the moon as it's watching over this, but you can actually see faces within that. And they didn't represent things in a kind of a metaphysical way. They were very straightforward with the type of imagery that they would put forth. Wow. Another very famous painting, which I yeah. think you're going to recognize these kind of images from the items you have, right. is an <clears throat> image again. Is it the sun chasing the moon across the sky? Look at those, the detail on this. It looks like they're flying a craft. They're pushing buttons on what appears to be a, a control panel. There's a little starburst, almost like a NASA logo or something yeah. on the side of this craft as they're moving yeah. across the night sky course the star could represent night and that's why it's uh, it's imposed over this moonlight craft but again it's something that makes you wonder because you see what the angels look like in this portrait you see what the saints and the the uh, disciples look below it with their halos and and how it looked so if that's what they were representing why are they representing the sun and the moon in this way they didn't believe there were gods inside that that was not part of the belief system at that time no. and these things are shaped like spacecraft cool like craft and they right. have they have people in them <laughs> right now here we've also got an interesting image a very early art depiction of the crucifixion of jesus and then the enlarged segment on the other side of the screen almost where you would see an artist's signature you see what appears to be a ufo in oh, motion yeah. look at that right uh i have not seen that one before that's amazing Here's, here's an interesting one, the Annunciation, yeah. when, when Mary was informed she would be carrying the, the God child. You see this craft hovering above the sky, beaming almost a beam of light telepathically into her head, which we know from people we've spoken to, that is how a lot of these aliens are known to communicate is through okay. telepathy. How would, you, how would you project that in a painting from that time? You, you know, you would, you would take the craft and you would show a beam of light going right directly into the head of the person that they were communicating with. It would uh, look just like that. <laughs> exactly. Now we continue on more with the birth of Christ and the beginnings of it. And as you see in this depiction of, of um, the angel and the baby Jesus and Mary uh, praying over him in the background, you see again, this craft that's illuminated. You see one of the shepherds on the hilltop looking up into the sky yeah, at this craft. Checking it out. And this is, some people have tried to say, well, this is the crown of God, the glory of God. No, there were very clean ways the church wanted these things depicted. What was the church trying to tell us back then? Here's an even better version of that image. Yeah. That talks, you know, and shows the, the beauty of it, but it definitely looks, this does not look like a crown. This looks like a, a atypical 1950s UFO. Yeah. Beaming Even light. the dog is looking up at it. Right. Yep. And then you've got, now this is one of my favorite pictures, right? Mm -hmm. This is the glorification of the Eucharist. Now, this painting is gorgeous. It's, um, and, and it looks, at first glance, to me, it looked like the earth is between Jesus and God. Above it is the Holy Spirit. And right. maybe they've got quills and they're writing the history of earth. And that was my interpretation of seeing this faraway version of this. But as you see in this next portrait, <laughs> This is some kind of craft. This is some kind of mechanism. You can see the rivets. You can see the metal banding, the telescoping antenna. This was painted in like the 13, 1400s. This looks like the, uh, what is it? The Death, Death Star in Star right. Wars? Or it looks a lot like Sputnik. Yeah. Look yeah. at the image of Sputnik and then Absolutely. look at the image that they're showing here. What well, is it this? Looks, it looks like it's it's made of metal panels i mean it's it's right. not the earth i mean it 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 looks like a, a metal circular object that uh, like a satellite yeah it is crazy and these things exist these images have existed around us for all time now again when you look at the handwriting of, of a lot of these receipts that were given to these artists in no way did it say uh you know put a craft or we want you to represent uh, the you know christ in the sky but what was it that they were trying to depict to us in that time era. And remember, Scott, you know this, how few actual examples of Renaissance art still exists. And in much of it, there are these UFO craft that appear in the sky. Yeah. I, I mean, as somebody who looks at, you know, cave paintings, looks at images, see, sees things like this, when, when you look at this, what if you were going to keep your mind open, what would be your other interpretations towards what they might have been trying to display to us? Well, in light of some recent research that um, 
that I've been involved in with uh, <clears throat> with my wife, Janet, and um, uh, a good friend by the name of Don Rue, we are learning that there are certain medieval groups, namely the Knights Templar, who had possession of documents that go down this road of, um, of, of aliens and um, their involvement in certain biblical events. So, and, and one in particular that we have that is part of this whole research we're doing, which has not been published yet. So we're kind of sharing something with you that's new. Um, it's, it's a document that's called the Book of the Wars of the Lord. And if you Google it right now, what you'll find out is it'll say, well, this is talked about in the Bible. It's mentioned in the Bible, I think in Numbers, and uh, but no extant copy exists to this day. And we have one, uh, at least part of this document in this compendium, uh, compendium of material that we're working on that's connected to the Knights Templar. So these are some of the secrets that apparently were hidden away. The question we ask is who hid it away? It seems the church did. Now, I can, I can understand, I can see an argument why somebody would say the church would want to do this. They, would, they don't want to deal with the subject matter of aliens because it would certainly complicate their message. There's some other heretical stuff in these documents, but there's no question that part of what we read in there can only be interpreted as having to do with, uh, you know, a silver beast descends from the clouds with wings like a bird that shoot out bolts of lightning that killed the uh, the enemies of the sons of Dan. And so, you know, so this has been out there for a long time. We think this goes back uh, to before Jesus, Jesus's time. So the fact that it's being depicted in this artwork coming into the Renaissance period, this is certainly nothing new to the church, but I would think the church would want to suppress this. And so why did these artists do this? Well, one of the reasons I think is that they were, initiated artists that weren't necessarily on the squad with the Roman Catholic Church. They may have been Templars. They may have been initiates with orders that had this information. It looks like the Templars had it. And we know people like Leonardo da Vinci was on the squad, was a Knights Templar, a Grand Master in his time. Most people don't know that. And so he would have understood these secrets. But why they chose to put it in their artwork and why the church chose to accept it uh, that's that's a mystery right there. I mean, what do you think? Why do you think that these images were allowed to survive? Well, is it the fact that, you know, the artists themselves, as you say, may have been initiated trying to relate the truth of these moments yes. and depicting it in a way, but then, you know, playing it up to the church. Oh, well, this is representative of, of the knowledge of God, the, the golden light of Christ and this and that. Could they have been doing this and looking for ways to, you know, disassociate with what they were really showing, but still getting the message out there to those in the know. And I know well, this sounds all Illuminati and, and conspiratorial, and but there is an angle of that to our world, and there's no doubt about it. Well, the other thing, it could be, it could be a case of hidden in plain sight. And what I mean by that is, let's say you are initiated artist and you, you understood that that orb, that last piece of art that you showed that actually looks like a, a, a machine, a device, um, a satellite, perhaps. I mean, how would a medieval church authority be able to look at that and say, no, that's a metallic object that's been constructed to fly out in outer space and record data for, they, they don't know what that is, right? Maybe they thought it was the artist's interpretation of whatever, um, you know, church accepted explanation that, that they gave them. But they, the point is, is how would they know what they're even looking at at that time? So the initiate that had the knowledge could veil it right in front of them. And they wouldn't even know what they were looking at. And here we are centuries later looking at it and going, I know what that is. I mean, that might be what's going on. Christine Carey says, humanity has circled through many thousands of years. We are just now starting to relearn what has been fear taught out of us for centuries. Direct connections that have been hidden and controlled by religion. And, and we're not trying to demonize religion, but you understand it is a big business. And if it starts suddenly telling you that there are other planets. Well, then are we really God's chosen ones? We're a very egocentric 
race yeah. of beings and we want it to be all about us. And there are many books that are not part of the canonical Bible as we know it, um, that were left out and tell much different stories. Yeah. Uh, some tell very dark, bleak stories, right? And but yep. they're referenced, the book of Enoch being another one, is yep. referenced in different parts of the Bible, but is yet not included. And when you push scholars, they tell you it's because, well, the narrative didn't really fit what the church wanted to teach. Well, but if it, it is it, truly the word of God, who are we to say, well, we want to teach it this way, God, we'll we'll take it from here, right? Well, yeah, and you know, the Book of Enoch is is to me one of the most uh, important of these ancient documents. And actually, within Freemasonry, um, the Book of Enoch in various forms is featured prominently. Uh, in fact, the Book of Enoch uh, is featured uh, on the Kensington Runestone. This is something that that I discovered when I became initiated as a Freemason several years ago. So. Again, you know, you can have information. The Bible is another document that can be read at two levels, right? One is for the people that are not initiated and that the stories are about people and the events in their lives. And then on another level, these stories are not about people. They're about the interactions of the stars, the planets, the constellations, the sun and the moon. And it's a whole different narrative. Uh, if you choose to look at it that way. So the more I think about it, Dave, the more I think that this art that contains images of uh, extraterrestrials and things that are happening that indicate that we're not the only ones here, uh, I think it was put in there because they knew they could get away with it. And even if somebody questioned them, if a church authority questioned them, there was plausible deniability built into it where they could say, oh, no, that's that's Christ's crown. It's my version of the crown. So I, 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 the more I think about it, the more I think that's what's going on. Agreed. Uh, we have to take a quick break and we're going to come back swinging. Uh, I'll <laughs> tell you the story of, of my friend, Scott Walter and the mind blowing night that I had hanging out with him. Uh, but first this Friday, May 20th, discovery plus drops a brand new groundbreaking show. It is a two hour documentary called alien Endgame. In 2021, a groundbreaking Pentagon report revealed what the government had denied for decades. UAPs, unidentified aerial phenomena, or UFOs, are real and may even pose a threat to our planet. In Alien Endgame, an all-new Discovery Plus two-hour documentary that begins streaming this Friday, May 20th, former members of the U.S. military break their silence about massive cover-ups of their terrifying close encounters. And now we're all left to ask, are we prepared? for an alien invasion. A series of mystery sightings in the sky are raising national security concerns now. Navy pilots say they saw something that defies the limits of known aviation technology. For decades, the U.S. government has ignored reports of unidentified flying objects harassing our military. Lying to the public is part of what we do. You pay us to do it. Finally, a groundbreaking Pentagon disclosure makes one thing clear. UFOs are real. The U.S. Navy has finally acknowledged that videos appearing to show UFOs flying through the air are real. The Navy says it still doesn't know what the objects are, and officials aren't speculating. For the first time ever, members of the military are breaking their silence. I never spoke a word about my incident for almost 40 years. With shocking revelations. There was no doubt that an unidentified flying object took our missiles off alert. And horrifying encounters. It's nothing that words can even describe. It's like an orb, man. Look at that shit. It's pulsating. But are we prepared? A single UFO would have the ability to wipe out the Air Force. For a war of the world. The real worst case scenario is that we are targeted for total extermination. I should have. Yeah, that's amazing. Alien Endgame this Friday, May 20th. You'll be able to watch it going forward on Discovery+. Plus. I also want to remind you guys, this Friday... We've got uh, the Paranormal 60 News, and it is Monsters, Bigfoot, Man, Bat, Reptilians edition. Eric, Marty, Greg will join me. We've got some amazing stories to share with you on that that are going to make you laugh, smile, and have a good time with us. 
I will be at ParaPsyCon 3 all weekend beginning this Friday at the Ohio State Reformatory, and I would love for you to come on out and hang out with me. We've got presentations all weekend. There are vendors on hand and a paranormal investigation. You can find information at darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com. All right, Scott Walter, my good buddy. Uh, we have hung out. We have talked. We have um, had great conversations about Jesus and the ossuaries and the the temples and the hook decks and the the uh, <laughs> the rune stone. And and not until a week ago did you pull back the veil on your holy <laughs> sh moment for me. Yeah, it was so funny. He's so nonchalant about this, folks, as we're talking. And he's like, oh, yeah, well, you know, you should see. I've, I've got a couple of interesting what could be considered alien artifacts. And um, I don't know how much you want to tell people before we start popping up these pictures. <laughs> but uh, do you want to explain briefly kind of how these came into your possession and why yeah. you believe them to be real artifacts? Well, uh, the evidence is 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 pointing in that direction for sure. Um, I first became um, aware of these artifacts at a conference in Minneapolis here at God, it's at, it must be 10 years ago called the Paradigm Symposium. And I was uh, asked to speak at that conference. And um, I remember walking in and there were some vendors, you know, in one of the areas. And I walked by this table and there was a guy standing there. He had glasses on, he had a hat and he was, uh, you know, just, just a really interesting guy. And I looked at his table and I saw these artifacts and I just, they just stopped me in my tracks and I picked them up and I started looking at them and I'm like, what the heck is this? And I, I, the more I looked at them, the more I could see, but there was just something captivating about them. I mean, first and foremost, I looked at them. I thought these are beautiful. And the artwork is phenomenal. But then the closer I looked, the more I could see things that were telling me uh, that it was not, uh, the images depicted were not of this earth. And I I looked at them and I picked them up and I said, hey, what do you want for them? He said, well, this one's this much and this one's that much. And I started putting together a pile and I got so carried away, I ended up buying the whole table. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, don't blame hey, you. give me a deal for all of them. And he did. And I took them all and um, I don't regret it. Now we will tell you as we continue on how some of the testing protocols have gone yep. on and, and, and dating on some of these items, but I'm going to show you in some of these, I'm going to tease because I'm going to start off with the back of the item, which is less dynamic, but equally cool. So we're going to start with some of these images. Now, remember folks, these were taken by me, Scott, Scott and his wife, Janet, allowed me to look, touch, feel, taste. All right, I didn't taste, but I did <laughs> photograph each one of the items. Taste, yeah, okay. they jerks. Um, so this is uh, this is one of the first items that Scott showed me. And uh, now I elected to go sideways on this so that it's a bigger image. Up and down, you're going to lose some of the detail. But you can see this image is fascinating, right? And Scott, you see this. And... I mean, what is your initial thought when you when you look at it? The, the, the great pop culture piece, right? It, well, it looks like um, a you know a, a thing of grapes um, with instead of juicy tasting uh, fruit, it's alien faces staring sure. at you, carved in three dimensions, and they're all piled together. And it's, I mean, you know, it's. Kind of stunning at first, but when you look at it, it's the artwork is is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's stunning. It's three dimensional, and um, it's one of my favorite pieces. Then the best part is, is there's a surprise on the other side. Look at that! <laughs> now look at the imagery of UFOs. I don't know that one alien appears to be riding in the tunnel of love ride uh, in the giant <laughs> swan, but the now look at this. Look at that image of yeah. of above looks like something in a craft. Does that look familiar? Yeah, I was going to say it looks just like that medieval artwork that you you showed earlier. Right? There it is. Yeah, look it looks that. just like that. And Dave, Only more detailed and more spacey, definitely. Yeah, it's got more of a, you know, it looks like it has a, a, a rocket engine on the back or something. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Dave, this is just one of many that show that sort of iconography of um, a person, um, whether it's a, a, a human or an alien inside of a craft like that, but they're very small. 
just mm -hmm. just like that. And what they are, I have no idea. I can tell you what that is below it. <laughs> what is it? That looks like a spaceship, the type yeah, of sure spaceship is. we saw in the artwork, the um, you know, the kind of spaceships that we we typically think of when we think of UFOs. I mean, that's that's a now that's coming classic. off of that, coming off of that UFO that we're looking at. Yep. Um I, I've got a new perspective on this after having gone and gone with you on uh, what was it Saturday night to um, hear an amazing talk about the cosmos yep. and astro, uh, yep. <clears throat> not astrology, astrophysics um, by Dr. or Professor Brian Cox. Does that not look like a wormhole that it's coming out of? Well, or perhaps yeah. heading into. Yeah. Well, if I, I can't quite see it, I might have to put my, uh, my cheaters on, but I think that's a spiral. Right. And and so the spiral takes on a whole different significance because uh, it, it, the spiral is the most common uh, depiction symbolically of uh, the golden ratio or the Fibonacci sequence, which is the key to life in the universe. Mm -hmm. So in a way, what that's telling us is that whatever is in that spacecraft is well aware of the Fibonacci sequence and this whole secret of life. And maybe what it's doing is projecting that life force out there. I mean, I don't know. Or maybe it's a wormhole. Maybe that's, you know, because the spiral, it's like the old 60s the commercials with tunnel. Batman where they, right. they zoom in and they go through a, a, a time change or a time warp. I mean, I have no idea, but those types of, of depictions of these bubbles coming off of people in spacecraft they're all over these artifacts. All right. We are only one item in. I have, I I will tell you, StreamYard said, whoa, you've, you've loaded too many files. I had to go back and pull some out. So I'm not even showing all of the images I took because <laughs> it only allowed me to go to 100 images. So we've got a lot to get through. Let's take a look at this piece. Now, here's an interesting piece, right? Mm -hmm. This is the reverse of of one of the items. And I'm sorry, I should have cropped these a little bit better. I just, I had so many to try to load up. Here is the front of that same piece. Oh, I love that piece. Now, what's interesting, Scott, you were telling me all these little pictograms that are seen across the face of this. These symbols, yep. Uh, amazing symbols, but none of them repeat on any no. of the items that you have. Over no. thousands of different little icons and none of them repeat. I actually wrote them down, Dave. There's a book. I could probably dig it up here if you gave me a couple minutes. But I wrote all of these symbols uh, on the artifacts I had because I was trying to see if there was a pattern, a, a, a language, an alphabet, something like that that had some order to it. But there wasn't. Not one of those. It's not over there, Jane. <clears throat> It's, it's upstairs, but that's okay. Anyway, she was trying to look for it. Um, I know it's upstairs. I can find it. But but the point is, is that none of them repeat. And what I think is going on, um, my gut feeling is, is that everything that I've heard, you and I have talked about this, Dave, is that the way that uh, these ETs communicate is they can verbalize like we do and, and talk, but their preferred form of communication is through telepathy, I guess I'd right. call it telepathy, where they don't speak and they can just, you can have a conversation just mentally. And maybe what these are, these symbols are depicting is a conversation. Um, because when you have a conversation, you don't often say the same sentence, uh, the same thing twice. It's always a stream of consciousness that is a unique thing. And maybe that's what those symbols are. It is. It's fascinating. And it's interesting that the eyes are left untouched and so is yep. the mouth. The yep. mouth in all of them seems to be closed. So it does portray that. Is he telepathically giving a message? Uh, Scott and I are working on a follow-up to tonight's show. We haven't even finished this show. And we're already working on a follow-up <laughs> to put, put a few things to the test. So stay mm -hmm. with us. We're going to be doing that. Melina Crane says ancient code. Um, I do love the shape of that one. And, and, uh, Dave Dwyer or Dave Dyer says, Ooh, we should market that as a toilet seat. <laughs> oh, come on, man. What's uh, up? Hey, alien toilet seats. I, I think we've got a, maybe a new NFT. Let's keep <laughs> buzzing through. Here's another reverse image. Yeah. That's this one right here. Uh, yep. I, I, yep. And then here is the front image that, uh, yeah. Scott showed. Now this one, the mouth is, I would, I don't know if I would say that it's open, but the teeth are exposed. Right. You could argue that it, it its mouth is open, but the fact that there's the images on the other side, the text, if you will, 
um, yeah, what, what's going on with that baby there? Is it, it all, you know, they're all, they're always, not always, but often looking to the heavens, right? Like the mm -hmm. one you showed before this, they're putting their hands to the sky. In this case, he's looking up and it's like, he's offering this baby. Here's another one. That guy's looking up and he's making an offering of, I don't know, a sphere, uh, inside of a, a cradle of some type. Um, you know, something that's going on above them. Now, what's on the top? Is there a spaceship on that? Yeah, I think there is. I don't yeah, know there that I, is. Got, I didn't get full photos, so let me pull it down. Can yeah, you hold here it up it is, the right camera? Here. I can show you. That's nuts. Now, this piece was worn as a ceremonial type of piece of jewelry. Right, it would have been worn as, as like a pendant or a breast a breastplate. This is more of a pendant. But so they're looking up at this spaceship. I mean, clearly that's what they're doing, right? right. And they're apparently offering um, a, a, a baby, looks like an alien baby, and some type of object in the other case. Is that what's going on? They're, they're praying to the gods, as it were, and are the gods aliens? Right. That's right. what this piece seems to suggest. Now, this piece looks like an interesting chess piece, but there's much more to this. I just wanted a close-up of the little alien head figure that sits atop it. And right. uh, tell us a little bit about this this beauty. This <laughs> well, I dagger. brought this one over too. I didn't know which ones you were going to uh, to show tonight, but this is, I mean, as as a work of art, this thing is just amazing. You know, there's the guy on the top. The blade has got these beautiful serrations, and there's depictions on the blade. Um, you know, more alien iconography. What looks like a um, uh, if you look closely, you can see this guy is wearing, he's got like a, um, like feathers. Like angel like, wings, right? Yeah, flying. Like an angel. But take a look at what he's coming out of. Yeah, a craft. And then there's a another craft. little UFO right next to him. So let me ask you something, Dave. When Please. you look at something like this, I know what I think of. Uh, from a biblical standpoint, could these be archangels? Yeah. That is certainly what it appears to be, right? That crossed your mind, didn't it? Uh huh. Or the Nephilim, yeah. right? Yeah, I mean, very cool. All right, let's. Uh, we got a buzz. We got a buzz, folks. All right, keep going. Bring our it next on. one. This is cool because this you brought out was in the yeah. shape of like a little UFO. Yeah. All right, and then Here it is. The, you know, great minds think alike. This yes, and this ours is, too. Yeah, and <laughs> but you know, but here's here's the thing that's cool about this piece, and you can see mm -hmm. it really well on on the picture you took. There are adornments. You can see green and red and white. And there's a little dude on the bottom there, a little alien. And these are really important because there's an adhesive that was used to affix these adornments. And one of the things that I wanted to do from the get-go with these objects is to try to figure out a way to date them. How can we date these objects? Well, the rock itself is not going to be datable, at least not to the point of when these were made. Obviously, the rock is very old, but the, the question is, how old are these artifacts? So if we're able to date the glue, and that was the first thing that came to mind uh, for a way to possibly date these, these are the kind of artifacts that will work. Now, on a case like this, you'd probably have to take off these adornments and, and, and deface the artifact, if you will, which I'm not going to do to this one, but we have done it on others and we've gotten some good, very interesting dates. Okay. Can you give me some idea of dates that you got on this one? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question, Dave. <laughs> me too. That's why I had you here. Yeah. Well, you know, the story I like to tell people how I got into the dating. Real, real quickly, Carol Garcia, what is the rock made of? Oh, the rock is rock. actually a zeolite mineral, which is sort yeah. of a junk um, uh, secondary mineral that occurs in volcanic rock. And uh, in some of the artifacts that I bought in that collection, there were actually big panels that came out and on the back sides, they were they were carved and polished with the imagery on one side. But on the other side, it looked like it was peeled right off of a wall. And it was, you know, that, like it was part of a joint fracture filling at one time and there's actually pieces of the volcanic host rock still attached to it so we know that it's associated with volcanic rock but it's a secondary uh mineral uh deposition in fractures in volcanic rock uh sean 
uh, Mc, is it McNatt says, I love this. The Zuni believe they were brought here by star people. Yeah. Uh, Ann Cobb has a question. Did the guy that sell you all these tell you where he got them from, Scott? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. Um, and are we going to tell him where? Uh, no, we're not. No, well, we're not going to tell him specifically. Can we tell him the country? I wouldn't at this point. I would hold off because. You want to hold off? Okay, that's yeah, fine. I, I just think, well, I know you've mentioned it on your show. Uh, yeah. So, I, you know, let's make people go back and watch uh, your programs to find Fair that enough. information okay. a little bit. But I also hey, audience, think because, I just want you to know I was ready to tell you, but this guy said no. Okay. I'm just saying, just saying. Here's an interesting question. <laughs> Any of the rocks made of black obsidian? Uh, black obsidian, I have not. I have seen some other geologies. Um, uh, most notably, I have seen limestone or marble. Um, I'm trying to think if there's any others that come to mind off the top of my head. We do have a black stone coming up that's, again, one of my favorites. Uh, Gene Johnson says, what a treasure to have this collection. It truly is. And, yes. Uh, Agreed. Amazing, amazing pieces. So let's let's dive back in. Now, this is the bottom. I was mentioning to Scott when I saw this, this has that Geiger look like the alien from the Aliens movie. Right. How about the pigment itself, the black lining? Is that just from dirt from the centuries or is that a pigment that you could date? Well, that's a great question. In some of the artifacts, it is dirt. I mean, there's dirt in the grooves, but in others, I can actually see under the microscope what looks to me Almost like, you know, when you're driving down the road and you see those uh, uh, state uh, DOT vehicles that are spray painting the lines, you know, the, yellow, the white yellow lines on the road. It's almost like at the bottom of the grooves, there was a machine that dropped ink into it. It's incredible. That's not on all the artifacts. I've only seen it on a few, but um, I, I don't know how they would do that. Look, CJ, the blabbermouth, that's the name she should have. If you watch the episode, you'll find out it was Mexico where he found And it. I so know who she is. And so she's do I. to hear all about it, the big mouth. <laughs> yeah, blabbermouth CJ, who couldn't just let people go watch your show to find out, but it's okay. We, we put right. it out there. All right, so this reminds me very much, it's very reminiscent of the Easter Island, Ed. You know what? It kind of does. It kind of does. Um, this is my favorite piece. That was really the crown jewel on the table and um, he had a lot of money for it. And when I, when I decided to buy the whole collection, I was able to get it at a much more affordable price, but that piece is just stunning. And if you look, it's, it's comprised on the outside of individual pieces of rock of different, uh, different colors, different shapes, but the red areas in between the pieces of rock is the glue and the adhesive that I was talking about. And this particular piece I have tested the glue and I got a date back. That's your drum roll. And the date is that particular piece came back about 14,000 BP, which is before present. So that would be about 12,000 years BC. Holy cow. That piece so, is 12,000 years old, at least the adhesive that's putting all of the, the mosaic together. Yeah. And you know what? I mean, now, Dave, having said that, okay, mm -hmm. I want to be clear about one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say this date, I don't want people to think that the work is done. That's exactly what the date is. And we all got to just rewrite the narrative. We also have to make sure that we uh, are able to not falsify this type of data. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is, is there a way that this could be done to get a date like that? And these pieces are not that old. Well, one way that I have thought of is if you took, say, fossil mammoth bone, which easily can go back to anywhere from six to 25,000 years is very common age for uh, mammoth bone. And I've worked uh, extensively in the fossil business and I could get that tomorrow if I wanted to. And let's say you ground some of that up and you mixed it with a glue and then you made one of these artifacts using that glue and you tested that glue. Would it come back the same date as the bone? It might. We need to do that to see what happens and then also test it to see if we can figure out if this glue on these artifacts could potentially be that. The other thing that is possible that we still need to test for is there's an ancient tree sap material that uh, indigenous cultures use in the, in the jungle areas of, um, you know, Central and South America that is called copal. And it's actually a tree sap that can go... Uh, into an inert state. 
and it can actually exist for thousands of years, tens of thousands of years, and then it can be heated and reactivated and used as an adhesive. Now, could that be what this is? In other words, it was an old glue that was used to make a new artifact. We don't know the answer to that question yet either. So as exciting as these test dates are that we have, we still have some work to do to get to the bottom of this and say, well, they didn't fake it this way. It's not using a modern adhesive. It's not Copal. Okay, now the party's, party started. Now here's one of my first favorites. Uh, I call this the, uh, the division bell, the Pink Floyd Div division bell. You showed me this. This is astounding. Uh -huh. yeah. And it's like half a face with this clock timepiece eye. Um, and I'm going to get closer in on some of the pieces, folks. Here's here's the timepiece with lightning bolts across it. And and all of it is removable. It's it's absolutely stunning. This is what the little centerpiece looks like. Yep. And I, I got out. that in my pocket. Scott didn't see that. Hey, hey, where's that <laughs> piece? <laughs> and then now here's where it gets even more interesting, right? Look at the imagery on this. Yeah. This is beautiful. Uh, and, and it obviously is telling a story. There are all these different details on it. Now, when hey, you Dave, flip it over, Dave, yeah. I, I just want to interrupt real quick. You Please. see the white lines in that piece, right? We sort of pepper through the rock and that is, those are secondary uh, calcite fillings in most cases. And the rock itself that they're using is stunning. I mean, you could take this rock and you could make beautiful uh, panels and put it on the walls of your house or your, you know, your flooring, and it would be high buck stuff. They didn't pick cheap rock. They used beautiful rock. And this one is especially beautiful. Forget the imagery. The rock itself is stunning. And then you add everything else. And oh my God, I know what you're going to say on this piece. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm champing at the bit, right? So this piece almost appears to be showing a representation of Anubis, yep. right? The, the protector of the underworld, the, you know, the death God, and he is holding out uh, some kind of sacrifice on the other side there is another image of a bird god much like the one you've seen in moon Knight, and he is holding out uh, uh some kind of sacrifice as well and i'm sorry that uh, i'm gonna get better pictures of these to show again in the future for you to blow up and look at but this is pretty compelling in itself now here's the interesting thing this god is known as the god that breathes life or brings life um the other god anumas the, the god of death in the underworld and it's interesting that both of them are diametrically opposed on the same piece. And Dualism. In, right. In between them. <laughs> look at that, folks. A, a UFO above them, UFO yep. surrounding. But then you've got what is very clearly an alien face in between. This is one of the first ones that when I saw it, I was like, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> Carol, Carol Garcia says th that looks like the Incan lines. Uh, um the yeah, looks like hieroglyphs. Lines. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I call it the the um, division bell image because, again, it looks a lot like the division bell image from the Pink Floyd album. <laughs> yeah. Paranormal it Pixie. It does. Paranormal Pixie says this needs to be a two hour episode. It does, but we're not going to. We're going to try to keep <laughs> it as close as we can. Let's power through a couple more pieces. Here's another one with uh, yeah, two different. I love themes. that piece. Yeah. Gorgeous piece. And uh, I got to go back in and pull down Pixie's comment. Um, here's an interesting question. Uh, Francis, Pete says, how do they make the stone surface so smooth? Well, it's polished. I mean, we've looked at it under the microscope and clearly you can see micro scratches in, in um, circular and, and it's not, it doesn't look like it was used with a, with a power tool type of thing, but mm -hmm. clearly it's been polished and that surface is not perfectly flat. The, the polishing sort of follows the undulations, the natural under undulations in the rock. And there's, you know, chipped off edges, um, but they just made use of the space as best they could. And um, I, I, again, it's just beautiful work, but still kind of keeping the natural beauty of the rock, if you will. Right. I'm, uh, being a geologist, I appreciate the rock almost as much as what's what's carved into it. Well, then I'll trade you for the rocks in my front yard, which are beautiful for all we'll of these. We'll talk later. We'll yeah. talk later about that. I love you. You're <laughs> one of the best. <laughs> oh, man. And this one seems to have a depiction of almost, is that the ark, or not the ark, but the uh, the chalice of God? What is that? The, um, I can't think of the word now. Indiana Jones yeah. drinks out of it and saves his oh, life. Oh, the grail and, cup. Right. Looks like the grail or could be some kind of uh, uh, like a throne 
that's on there. Interesting. Or maybe let's, a device. I a mean, device, no. right? Uh, let's see what else we've got here. Some of these were just interesting. Now we start getting into some of the little figurines. Yeah, I love that one. Look at him. Yeah, he's almost like he's giggling, laughing oh, at us, right? Yeah. Me. Oh, I tooted. Yeah, right. Here's <laughs> one. Uh, again, all the imagery on here, and it seems they're holding up another sacrifice. Uh, and again, you know, reaching for the heavens, and uh, and it, with an alien ship above it, there's no mistaking that they venerate these gods in the sky, these these aliens in the sky. Now, here's an interesting piece. Is this depicting the conjunction of human? And alien. If you look on the bottom, it does look like this is some sort of mother figure holding a baby. Yep. And you see the depiction of two different faces, which does become thematic in some of these pieces. Right. You know, is one it's human. It's a recurring theme. It's right. a recurring theme. Uh, is one human, one alien, and this is the result, the hybrid that she's holding. Um, this has got an interesting back, right? It's got the serpent on the back. Serpent, yeah. Now, I wanted to point this out to you because I don't think you understood my reference the other day. What really blew me away is on the very bottom of this image is obviously uh, Futurama's Bender. <laughs> Actually, you're not, shiny you're metal not far off. Hey, Look at him. Could Futurama, like he's got a, could that have been based on one of these artifacts on that guy right there? Doesn't it even look like he's got a cigar hanging out of his mouth? <laughs> it does. Look at that. At the very bottom of that depiction, and there you have Bender. Oh uh, I just gosh. thought that was hilarious. Uh, all right. Now, here's another piece where I give you the back view first. And again, they're holding up and sacrificing these yep. little alien-like babies. Uh, here you've got the face, all the engravings. Again, none of these engravings repeat on yep. any of the objects that he has. We've got some more pieces where she's sitting there. She's got the little children around her, it almost appears. One is wait, sitting wait, on her Wait, knee. wait, wait. She? I. I could be a she. I would guess she looks um, very. Uh, Dave, do you remember oh wait, there is a wiener there, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. that. Uh, well, that's what it looks like to me. So I'm thinking this is daddy. Could be dad sitting with the kids on his knee. Uh, hey. Here's the reverse showing the pregnant mother. Yep. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, and we do have a, a graphic piece that shows up later of one giving birth. Yep just astounding pieces folks i hope you're appreciating this as much as i did seeing these because again if this was anybody else i think these are some little mexico trip you know trinkets yeah. uh but first of all they're high high class stone uh in in what they were made of the the detail and artistry in this would make them thousands of dollars to begin with um then we've got this little uh, gem <laughs> the baby the baby yeah. is sitting over there guarding my agate collection. <laughs> now, was this was this another one that you had tested? Uh, we have not tested this one yet, but it looks like we could. Um, mm -hmm. It's got the eyes are are inlaid um, inserts, so that could mm -hmm. be. What's it, what I find interesting is that pose, right? Um, right. That is the Osiris. We call it the Osiris pose, and mm -hmm. in Freemasonry. That is the position in which we, uh, uh, when we assume prayer, um, we 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 uh, we take the Osiris position, uh, the Osiris pose as it's caused uh, called. So um, I find that to be very interesting. Is that something that we learned from them, or where did it come from? I think they were teaching us how to swaddle our children. This is the first <laughs> in the the uh, Johnson and Johnson Bible guide of it. Here's uh, here's some more images of these creatures looking and again showing the depiction of a UFO. You've got the the reverse again, which looks like something in a craft coming out of hey, person. Dave, there... Dave yep. on that piece right there, you see that guy? He is uh -huh. in the Chuck Mall position. Are you familiar with that? Uh, if you go down no. to Chichen Itza, uh, uh -huh. they have statues where the guy is on his back and he's he's sitting there looking out to the side and his knees are up. That's called the Chuck Mall position. And if you look it up, you'll see that 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 position that he is in. Um, and and in the case of down in Chichen Itza, the statues are holding like a bowl, uh, like a libation bowl for hmm. ritual. Uh, I'm sure that's what it was used for. But that's the same position. Is that where they got it? Who knows? Maybe it's more of the images of one breathing life into another, and then coming up on the Nephilim or the angel figure. Yep. In this, again, UFO depiction on this piece. Here's another interesting element that this has uh, the monkey, the jackal, 
the wolf and the crocodile, right? So this is very the four square quadrants, yeah. Right. So it's very Egyptian in nature with that, but then you've very clearly got the alien head as the centerpiece. Yep. Here's the reverse where she appears to be giving as she's holding up. Now, is that is she is she sacrificing her husband in this one and giving birth to the next <laughs> giving child? Giving birth and saying, I've had enough of you, I'll take the baby. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh all right. So that that's pretty cool. Now these are these last batch. These are my favorites, folks. These are the ones I've held off on. So if you've stayed through the first hour and we're going to try to get through this as close to 60 minutes as we can, we start looking at these. And this is the image you see on tonight's banner. Um, now, drinking, do we know what that is indicative of? Is he drinking in life? Is it, do we know what's going on? That's the front of the one little alien head. Well, you have him drinking it in, or is it coming out of him? I mean, which is it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't know the answer, but uh, we do see oftentimes it looks like things are coming out, it seems to me. And the one you showed before, there was a, a human figure that had its arms around the, the, the wings of the archangel or whatever that is. But uh, to me, it seems like they're coming out. But I what, if, I what if that was the first depiction of a ghost? The physical form, and then you see the ethereal form heading towards the angel who's leading it to heaven it's doing the same thing here right yeah. but, but you know one is coming out and then it has a head and it's got more coming out of it it's mm -hmm. it's almost like a train of this you know mouth to body mouth to body oh now, the holy, big boy yeah this one's yeah, this big one is, guy this one's really interesting uh for many different and, and again i was i had to stop with pictures so i've only got three pictures left after this so i had to choose which ones this is a close-up of the face itself so that you could see the earrings. And by the way, we were able to test this one mm -hmm. um, on, the, on the attachment where the ears, uh, that the earrings are attached to, where it mm -hmm. met the, the face. I was able to test that. I can't remember the date, but that one was over 10,000 years old, too. Amazing. And not, 10, not a thousand, 10,000. Yeah. Wow. 10,000. 10,000. I mean, give me a break. Right. <laughs> it's just insane. So again, here's the full version. We did, I, I couldn't show the back, but also is covered in oh. these little hieroglyphs. Right. Um, now here, this is my favorite. I'm, I'm gearing people up for this. This one. I know what this one is. Oh, uh, this one. I know which one. Do you, do you remember my reaction when I saw this piece? When I yeah, looked at it. Now the rest away. of these. The same reaction I had, Dave, the first right. time I saw it, it was like, boom. Now look, folks, <laughs> a lot of these shapes, they're, they're, Similar Hawaiian mask shapes, Incan, Aztec, Mayan, these kind of monstery figures that, you know, in, in a lot of ways we could look at like um, gargoyles. Those were meant to be uh, offensive to dark forces. That's why they would put the scarier faces out front. It was a way to try to be offensive because anything that thought itself godlike would not want to cast its eyes upon that. So they would put up these scary images. So a lot of these, I'm like, all right, now, right. There's some in the shape of an alien head and, and they're, they're kind of intriguing and interesting to look at. But again, is that just, um, you know, big eye holes so that you could see through the mask? Is that what they're trying to depict? When I saw this image, my initial reaction was a few uh, colorful words that I can't repeat on tonight's show. But when you look <laughs> at this, there is no denying that this alien is eating a, um, snowball from uh, hostess i don't know what this is this is amazing is that the moon and the earth and the alien and uh, you know or is that the moon above is that is that uh, the asteroid that brought them here or the rocket that brought them here the ufo craft for this or, being? or is that larger one the sun i mean and True. you know some yeah. people say that there's um that uh, spacecraft actually travel through time, that the sun is a portal. I mean, could that be what's going on? I'm not saying it is. I don't know. But um, with those sort of cracks and lines in that big circle, I'm wondering if that's the sun. Now, for you conspiracy theorists, for you people that wonder where some of the imagery we've gotten in our world has come from, I want you all to just do me a favor right now. Just take a look at this image, which is amazing. Take a deep breath and just stare at it and then prepare for the reverse. Look at that beauty. No. The all-seeing eye. Now, at first, you notice there's these three half orbs that surround it. It almost looks like a Celtic knot. What did you refer to it as, Scott, when we talked at first? A tr well, um, I think we called it a Triscolus. Okay, right. So the intersecting three circles of life, yeah. right? 
Right, uh, depicting the father, son. Oh, the Vesicus, the Vesicus. Now, if you look, though, at each image, folks, and again, I'm sorry, I could not, this is the last one that allowed me to post. Each one is a half face of an alien, and they each appear to be radically different. Are those three of the races that were involved in bringing us here? Is right. each one of those uh, designs on the side a designation to which alien species it's from? But this is, when you saw this, and you've been a fan of, and the Illuminati histories and all these interesting facets of our history, when you first saw this piece, what was your initial reaction? Well, I was, I was absolutely blown away. And I said, first thing I said was how much do you want? <laughs> and it was actually <laughs> relatively affordable, but um, obviously the all seeing eye within the Delta is something that is a common image that we see in Freemasonry, but we also see it on our dollar bill right at the top of the pyramid. But I'll tell you, I have seen in some Catholic churches, I have seen this same image of the all seeing eye within the a Delta. And, you know, does it, is it, I, I think most people would uh, immediately think that it depicts deity, God, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's watching us all the time. Right. So that's why, um, you know, you got to live your life right. Otherwise, you know, God's watching and he will judge you. Um, but this is a common symbol of, like I said, Freemasonry. We see it in certain um, uh, Catholic imagery. And um, it's um, it's stunning. And why do we have these three apparent alien races depicted on the side? I don't know, but it's very common to see these faces in this half profile uh, as opposed to the full face that we see on many of the other artifacts. But this thing, it takes the cake. I'm with you, Dave. This is my favorite piece, too. It's it's stunning. It is so cool. Both sides just holy yeah. cow. Scott, I can't thank you enough for allowing me in, into your home and allowing me to see these pieces, hold them for myself. We are going to do some experiments, different types of experiments in the future with this and, and um, with Scott's help and work, and we will detail them on an upcoming episode. I'm hoping to get that done here by the end of this year to, to round out the year with it. Um, I know we're at a, an hour and seven minutes in this. Is it okay? I'm going to open up questions for the next five minutes, Scott. So if yeah, you have a absolutely. specific question for Scott regarding mm -hmm. any of this or his thoughts, and I, you know, I'll, I'll throw that out to you is, as you've been interested in um, history and, and to have this happen, how much of a paradigm mind-blowing shift was this for you to see this, this kind of depiction on so many different items? Well, it, it's, you know, <laughs> the thing about it is I've seen a lot of shocking things in my life and, and unexpected things. And so I, I sort of roll with the punches, but I have to say when I first saw these, it was one of the few times uh, my breath was taken away. I, t I had to take a step back and go, wait a minute. And, and part of the reason was I just wasn't exposed to this whole uh, alien phenomena. I didn't, I didn't have an opinion, um, but, but now I have a lot of opinions and I have e even more questions. So we're not done with this subject matter. We're only just getting started. No, this is, this is astounding stuff. I'm glad that we're able to share it, especially on the heels of this congressional yeah. hearing on UFO. The timing, the timing is not coincidence, Dave. I'm telling no, you. <laughs> no. It, I, I love the way it all came together that we were able to, you know, we, you showed me this stuff. We went to see professor Brian Cox talk about the narrative of space and time and time travel and the, the possibilities of these things. And then to look at these items is remarkable uh let me see we do have a question here same type of artwork i wonder if the same person did all of these gene johnson asks that's a great question and you know that was one of the things that we looked at as we started to study these pieces starting 10 years ago and one of the things we noticed was there was certain artwork that appeared to be done by the same person um but at this point, I, I'm not sure that that's the case. I'm, now, I, I have no doubt that one person probably made several pieces, but did this one person do all of the same imagery that we think we see? I don't think so, but that's a really good question. Ann Cobb asks, Scott, do you believe the aliens carved these, or was it the observation of the natives guided by the aliens? Well, the honest answer is I don't know, but I guess if I had to say, I think it was the indigenous people that were inspired by the aliens, by what they saw, 
and maybe what they learned and experienced. So I would, uh, and, and, you know, the other thing about this, Dave, is that they're so beautiful. They are so well done. The craftsmanship is absolutely top notch. But part of the reason for that, I think, is that these people in their minds were doing sacred work, special work, and it was important to them that not only did they create something that was accurate as far as what they were, the message they were trying to convey, but they wanted it to be as beautiful as they could. And they succeeded on both fronts. Carol Garcia asks, how do you choose which item is okay to test versus the ones that should not be tested? And we well, covered a that a little earlier, but go ahead. Yeah, but there's a couple of things that really come into play. Like, for example, you know, you have to have enough sample to test, right? You need a certain amount of the material to be able to get a good test result. And frankly, a piece like, you know, this beautiful spaceship with these tiny adornments on it, um, we'd probably destroy it in, in getting enough sample to test. So that one, I'm just not going to risk it. But um, on, on some of the others, especially the bigger pieces that they used a lot of glue, like like the alien three-dimensional head, it was easy to get a sample out of that one. So first and foremost, we have to be sure that we can get enough sample. And the other thing is, is you want to make sure that you're not totally destroying an artifact in the interest of getting a date. Are there some that we might need to do that with? Yes. But, um, you know, you got to be careful. And so it's each one is a unique thing, but uh, it all depends on the piece you know, can we get enough sample to test? That's really the the criteria. It's most important. Agreed. And and he mentioned that earlier. It was just items that he thought he'd have the best chance of getting right. information on. There, there are a few items we were unable to share, uh, and we will maybe do a follow-up on the show in the future and show some of the other pieces. Um, but I want to keep some of the pieces that have not been seen yet for the experiments okay. uh, and experiments that we want to do. That sounds um, great, Dave. <clears throat> yeah, uh, using... Uh, uh, I don't want to give it anything away. We're going to work on that. Scott, thank you. How can yeah. people keep up with you? I know I've got your your Twitter handle on tonight's show. I've got your hookedx.com website so people can find your books and other projects. Is there any other way to, to uh, know what you're up to? Well, I just tell people to go to my website, www.hookedx.com, spelled just the way it sounds, H-O-O-K-E-D-X.com, uh, or go to my uh, my blog site. If people want to interact with me and ask me questions or, you know, take shots at me, whatever you want to do, you can go to my um uh, my blog, which is at Real Scott, well, uh, scottwalteranswers.blogspot.com. And go on there, and I will answer all the questions. And there is a, a write-up. I did do um, a posting about the episode we did on America on Earth. Uh, it was season four, episode two. And you will see some of the artifacts there. None of the artifacts we showed today will uh, will be um, shown there. They're totally different, including the one we tested that we got an incredible date on that. Should I tell them what that date was? Sure. Or should they watch the episode? Well, since CJ Blabbermouth already ruined which episode it's <laughs> Thanks in. a lot, CJ. Yeah, go ahead and tell them. What, that what did one it come came back, back and, and, and I was not told what it was. Everybody, uh, you know, there knew what the date was except me. And when I opened it up, I was blown away 8,600 BP before present. So that's 60, um, 60, what, 6,400 BC. I mean, amazing. I, I mean, incredible. I mean, we yeah. don't even know what culture that was. I mean, who were the people that made these? Maybe it goes back to the question was it aliens? Who knows? Keep tuned in. We will continue to check out this journey, and Scott Walter will be along with me on this as we continue to explore, test, change hypotheses, ideas, and theories, and see what we might be able to come with next time we visit here. I want to thank our guest tonight, Scott Walter, and the amazing artifacts that he and his wife, Janet, curate and keep safe and protected so that we can see these items for ourselves. I want to thank you all for tuning in to this special edition program and being a part of it. Please share this episode. This is an important episode. Copy and paste the uh, YouTube link and share it with everybody. Uh, those of you listening to the audio podcast, please go check out the video. You want to see these photographs. I know you feel a little left out on it, but this is one of those that you need to see in order to believe. It is a fascinating time. Things are coming into perspective in a much clearer way. We've never been closer, I think, to understanding the truth of our place in the universe. And hopefully, 
we'll be able to find it together on this journey and that the things that we shared here tonight will make things a little brighter in your universe. Thank you for tuning in. Remember to check out the show. I will be back this Friday with the news crew. We've got Bigfoot, Man, Bat, Reptilians edition. That's going to be taking place. And please come see me this weekend at the Paris Icon 3 at the Ohio State Reformatory, Mansfield Reformatory, and have a good time with us. Uh, You guys are going to absolutely enjoy it. You can get information at darknessevents.com. That's darknessevents.com.